Welcome to Simply Cyber. Today I'm sitting down with Danny Jenkins, CEO and co-founder of ThreatLocker, to discuss how his company is redefining application security with a zero trust approach. We'll explore the unique challenges in this space and how ThreatLocker is empowering organizations to stay ahead of modern threats. Let's dive right in. Okay, so ThreatLocker is really mission is to change the paradigm of security from default allow to default deny. The way we approach security mostly now, the way most of the world is approaching security is we're going to try and find all the bad things in the world. What ThreatLocker wants to do is say, well, what do you need in your environment and everything else should be blocked? And we extend that into storage, into network, into what applications can do. And by doing that, we're not hoping we catch the next zero day in malware. We're able to block by default. And our goal as a company is to get as many companies to move from a default allow to default deny approach. What's the biggest challenge in security that organizations face today? I think the, the biggest challenge is organizations don't have control over how the application is written. So if they go and buy a program, whether it's something as simple as a webcam app or an exchange server or, or CRM system, they don't know what the code is. They don't know how good the developers are. They don't know how good the security reviews are. And they, of course, they can do all of those reviews. So it's really difficult for organizations to know what the risks are, because once they run that application in their environment, that application not only has access to its own data, it has access to all of the data on the machine it's running. What's the difference between Threat Locker and any traditional antivirus? So if you think about how antivirus works, is when a program is opened, when an executable, one, when a script is ran, that file gets loaded by driver. And the driver then essentially passes that to a service or runs it through a list and says, hey, do we think this is bad? And it will do one of two things. One is it will check a list of this is known bad things. Or the other thing, it'll let it launch and it'll see is it doing suspicious things. And those behaviors are constantly being updated by threat intelligence people and trying to figure out what's bad. The way Threat Locker works is when the program starts to load, we check, is it on your allow list of allowed programs? And if it's not on the allow list, it doesn't run. Now, building that allow list is a little bit more complicated because we built this massive learning engine that's able to figure out what you use in your environment. You do a profiling, we catalog all the applications, we track all the updates for you. So really all you have to worry about is letting go through a learning period. And if you want to introduce new software, your IT department does it in 60 seconds or so. Can you showcase how granular Threat Locker can be in helping security teams make informed decisions? So I think that's the first thing. Well, getting data is really, really important. But when we started Threat Locker, I remember the first version we put out there and I, I deployed it to a machine and suddenly there was thousands and thousands of rows of data. And as an IT person, it didn't mean anything to me. I saw this DLL, I saw the script file, I saw everything else. So what Threat Locker does is we take all this data and we match it. We have a massive labs team that do nothing but research applications, what their dependencies are, what they need to talk to. So we're able to say to the customer, here's a list of your applications. We can even tell them what countries they were developed in. So if you have a coupon clipper that was maybe made in China, they can see your passwords for every website you go to. We'll put this in a simple report for the customer to say, these are your, your risks. Maybe consider removing these applications or ring fencing them to limit what they can do in your environment. How does Threat Locker address new threats like zero day attacks or fileless malware? The thing is, is it's impossible to find every bad thing. So the way we ra rather approach it, and you know, for the traditional malware, for executables, very, very easy, block everything. But then we start thinking about applications like PowerShell, RegServe, RunDLL, Cscript, 7-Zip, all of which have capabilities built into them to be weaponized and used against you. So what we do is we say, well, what do those applications need to do? Does PowerShell need to go out to the internet? Probably not. And if it is, it's limited sites. When you take that simple function away, PowerShell now can't ingest malicious code from remote servers. Does it need to see all of my documents? No, it doesn't because PowerShell never looks at your documents, your file shares. So if you take away the application's ability to see your documents, it can no longer encrypt them or copy them or steal them. And it applies to all applications, but by doing that, we've been able to be really effective at stopping fileless attacks, vulnerabilities from being exploited. SolarWinds Orion's a perfect example. That backdoor required the application to reach out to a site on AWS, but because it didn't need to do that and it hadn't done that before, it was just simply blocked at zero day. Can you showcase an example where ThreatLocker really shines and how does it translate to positive ROI for organizations? The type of customers we have range from small organizations or massive organizations like JetBlue and uh, airlines and airports, Heathrow Airport is another one. And we do everything from helping them control what software can run right to what it can do. But one story kind of stands out to me. We had a customer come in once and he said, Danny, I think you guys saved us from a major cyber attack. And there was just one log and it said sstart.bat was blocked. And we checked it against every malware database and it wasn't malware. 
And I said, well, why do you think it's bad? And he said, well, look what it's doing. So we took it and we found that he had an exchange server with the exchange vulnerability. An attacker had connected to the exchange server. They'd exploited the vulnerability. They'd pushed a batch file to the startup folder through the vulnerability. And when the domain admin logged in, that batch file tried to run. It was blocked because it wasn't on the allow list. It wasn't no malware. It was just simply blocked because it wasn't on the allow list. We took that file and we put it into our lab. And when we put it into our lab, we ran the same thing. We had a whole Active Directory domain set up, simulators, environment, backup servers, laptops, desktops, without threat locker running. We logged in and within two hours, every device in that organization had been encrypted with ransomware servers, backup servers, laptops, desktops. And that would have been a disaster for the customer. So that kind of story for me is really great because nothing else detected it, but we blocked it out of the gate. How can ThreatLocker help professionals empower their security posture? So ThreatLocker gives a complete platform of endpoint and cloud security uh, products. The main focus is on things like allow listing, ring fencing, stopping applications running, and it's really, really easy. I think as a cybersecurity professional, the biggest thing you need to think about is detection is part of your security strategy, but it's your backup plan. When something's being detected as bad in your environment, it means it's already happened. The best thing you can do is implement secure controls and ThreatLocker can help you with a lot of those controls like allow listing, ring fencing, network controls. We can do some really cool stuff with dynamic ACLs on the network to make ports invisible for untrusted devices. If you take security from a, a least privileged approach, you're going to win the battle and it's going to be very, very hard for attackers to get into your environment. And then use the detection and response, which we can offer you and we have probably the best MDR in the world based in the US. It responds in an average of 60 seconds or less than 60 seconds. They will monitor everything, but that should be the backup plan and not the primary security mechanism. What's on the roadmap for ThreatLocker in the next six to 12 months? So we just released our uh, cloud detect and our cloud controls. Uh, first, they've integrated with Office 365. We're going to continue to expand that to other platforms. So AWS, G Suite, all different cloud platforms. And we're going to continue to plug into more firewalls and more integrations. The other thing we're really doing is everything we do is about how do we make it easier and more seamless for the IT manager to do the right thing? Because sometimes it's too easy to not do the right thing because it's difficult. So we want to make it really, really easy. Our average deployment now is less than an hour a week for five weeks on a say a thousand endpoint customer. We want to keep making that easier, making the experience easier. And that's what we're going to continue to do with ThreatLocker. So that wraps up our discussion with Danny Jenkins from ThreatLocker. I hope you gain valuable insights into the critical importance of AppSec and how a zero trust approach can make a real difference in your org security posture. Now, if you enjoyed this interview, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to Simply Cyber for more expert interviews and cybersecurity content like this. I'd love to hear your thoughts too, so feel free to drop your comments and questions below. Thanks for watching, and remember, until next time, stay secure.